We're gonna look at some CRP today. We're gonna look at native grasses, forbs, why you wanna plant it, how you wanna plant it, when you wanna plant it, um, different soil types, all the benefits. We're gonna cover everything A to Z. So now you're gonna know all the reasons why you should do something with your ground to utilize it for cover, income, and all the benefits that native grasses, whether it's in a program or not, um, the grasses and forbs can have for wildlife, for conservation, for soil health, and everything in between. We're gonna dive in. We're just testing this, testing this out, and I said to Brad, let's see if my hypothesis is right. But this is really high quality egg ground right here. Like, like 85, 85 CSR dirt. This has had a lot of nutrients incorporated into this over the years. But when we press down on our shovel, I can feel there's a lot of resistance getting down. And then when we pull it up, it is, I mean, this is better dirt. There's an earthworm. It does crumble. I do see holes in here. Um, but it's definitely more compacted soil. And there, you don't see a lot of, a lot of roots um, and tilth, if you will. So it, it's pretty hard compacted dirt. Now let's just go 10 feet away and look at the difference. And we're doing this off the cuff. So I said, I guarantee you it's gonna be different when we cross this line. Let's check this out. If you look here, there's all this residue and there's, there's roots in the soil. And the second I put my shovel down, it just goes in like butter. And this is 10 feet away. So it goes in like butter. And then when you look in here, you can see all these different root fibers. And then the soil breaks apart a lot easier. So, you know, and this has only been here for a few years. And for three years for this soil to sit here like this, the soil quality, just understanding soil, understanding farming, this soil is far superior in life, in productivity, all the, the living organisms in it compared to just 10 feet away. So one more huge reason to have things seeded down or even in a crop situation to do cover crops, to, having, to have a living root in the soil at all times. And that's why we overseed it out there. So I would say that crop ground we just looked at is actually better than normal. A lot of it's been, you know, across the Midwest has been just ripped apart every year, not had cover crops, not had manure. So that's actually high quality. So a lot of people are gonna see a lot more degraded soil than that. So just 10 feet away, huge improvements three years later. I started out on this farm, most of the organic matter, which is the, the broken down plant tissue that it fundamentally makes soil, was around 2.5 to 3 in a lot of these fields. This was definitely better, but some of these fields I brought from 3% organic matter to up close to 6%, one of them's 5.5 that I can think of. And what that's going to do is when people are getting droughts and they're having crop failures or, or failures of any type, it's going to absorb rain, it's going to hold it. And it's going to be, it's going to essentially make your dirt drought proof to, to a point um, when you have high organic matter in your soil. It's a critical component of your soil. CRP is going to bring that organic matter up. This is a uh, fourth or fifth year stand of Canlow switchgrass. I, prefer, I definitely prefer timber and brush for, for deer over switchgrass, but having these pockets like this, I actually ran a combine through this to take some of the seed heads off here and it left the plant standing. But the amount of bucks that were actually in little pockets of this that finally you'd have to get right up on them with a combine and they'd bust at the last minute was actually pretty astounding being up in there combining and seeing the bucks start off at the last minute or even does. But the fawns will come in here um, and escape some of the coyotes. The does will be in here. The bucks will definitely hang tight in this stuff. So sometimes it seems like they don't really use the switchgrass as much but when you actually get in it, and I had the luxury of being high up in a machine, um, to see how many bucks that actually utilize this and find the little bedding pockets in here was actually pretty surprising. And, and I, I mean, I clearly see them come out of here, but um, the amount of wildlife per acre that this can sustain is pretty astounding, you know, compared to like brome grass at six inches that does absolutely no good pretty much for wildlife. Um, this is definitely housing more wildlife and adding carrying capacity to the amount of deer and other wildlife you have on your farm. So this is this is a diverse mix I, I made that was approved by the FSA office. There's a lot of different forbs in here. So 
I wanted I wanted a, a mix one that was approved by the FSA office but I wanted a mix that was good for the deer for the birds for the wildlife the whole ecosystem and having these different forbs in here um, you know, I can come out and sit on my bean field over there and they're going to be in here eating these forbs. And a lot of times I don't even know necessarily what they're eating, but um, there's all these, hunt, probably with some of the weeds in here, there's 50 to 100 species of different plants in here. And I think I seeded about 20 of those. And, and they are definitely predominant. But this stand is just more of a diverse stand for all wildlife and this complies with the CRP program. So here's the debate a lot of people have, um, you know, and there's pros and cons to everything, but let's just say, you know, your ground was cash renting for 200 bucks an acre and CRP was paying $150 an acre. You're really not out $50 an acre. What this is doing for the soil on building the soil, on actually mining some nutrients out of the soil, with putting the root systems back in the soil, and earthworms in the ecology is adding value to the soil. And every time you farm it, a lot of times it's taking fertility out. Some of the farmers might put replacement rates of P and K in the soil, but a lot of times they're not putting the micros in there. They're destroying the soil, they're causing soil erosion. And that cost is to be paid at some point. So, you know, it's it's not apples to apples saying one, one pays 200 and one pays 150. Because I'd rather get paid 150, have all the benefits of the wildlife, have my soil be in better health, enjoy it, uh, the aesthetics of it. I, I mean, it's it's beautiful to look at. So there's all these benefits to CRP. If you had if you had something like 40 acres, and say 20 of it was tillable, you know, you could you could put 10 to 15 in. I'd still want a big portion of that to be food, maybe in a couple food plots. So it'd kind of be a case by case basis. But if I had you know, 100 acres of tillable, I definitely would put at least a portion of it into CRP. I always want a lot of diverse food sources and CRP actually adds to that too, but um, I want row crop, I want grain, I want some legumes, um, but, but CRP will always be a component when I'm talking any more than probably maybe 20 acres or more of tillable. Especially if somebody had three, 400 acres, absolutely you should be looking into CRP for a portion of that program. So how you get this stuff planted, every, uh, every gun governmental office will generally have a list of people who do this for hire. A lot of the NRCS offices have drills you can rent, um, so if you wanted to do it yourself. Um, I would definitely at least speak to somebody with good experience with planting CRP. Shoot me a message, check out Iowa Whitetail again. Um, there's a lot of methods for doing it yourself and hiring competent people and there is people who are incompetent at doing it that do not do a good job or have have good information or good knowledge so do your homework it's just like getting work done around your house when you hire somebody you do a little bit of due diligence check into them um, but yeah there's a lot of different ways you can do this yourself or hire it done and get exceptional results either way I can't leave this part out it just popped into my head how often should I burn? And I'm just gonna give my opinion on that. I burn about once every five to 10 years on a stand. And I generally do not burn more than about, I'd say at the most, 20% of my stand in a given year because I don't wanna burn it all and then have no cover for the deer and for the pheasants and for the quail and all the, uh, the, nursing, the nesting critters. And I also think fire is overdone to where it can actually set you back on some of the organic matter on top of the soil, burning up some nutrients. So I would say just, just burn your CRP in different pockets and don't burn general, I'd say a maximum of, call it 25%. Don't burn more than 25% of your stand in one given year. And then rotate to the next, rotate to the next as needed. And there's a lot of cases where it doesn't need to be burned. It, do, it definitely doesn't need to be dissed. Uh, occasionally it needs to be sprayed for cool season grasses, but just be really careful with not overdoing the fire or any of these things, because a lot of times it needs nothing, especially if it was established properly.